welcome. Uh, I'm a volunteer machinist here at the Air and Space Museum. It was in 19... Hold on. <laughs> We want to hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll back up. This is the 118th anniversary of the Wright Flyers' historic flights back at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. That took place in 1903. The Wright brothers realized to be able to have flight, powered flight, they needed to come up with an engine. They decided, or they calculated, they had to have an engine that couldn't weigh more than 180 pounds and had eight horsepower. Their engine came in at 200 pounds, but it had 12 horsepower. The museum back in 1993, 10 years prior to the centennial, decided they wanted to have a prototype of the Wright Flyer engine. Three of my predecessors in the machine shop in two and a half years made two engines. And this one has run on the anniversary every year since. The Bright, Bright Brothers had a fantastic mechanic machinist that worked for their bicycle shops, Charlie Taylor. This is a bust of him behind me. The engine just had to prove you could have powered flight. It wasn't for endurance or speed. And it's very simple. It doesn't have any spark plugs, it doesn't have a carburetor, it doesn't have an oil pump, it doesn't have a fuel pump, it doesn't have a throttle, but it runs. In 1903, the first flight back at Kitty Hawk was by Orville. He went 120 feet but that was the first powered flight. They did four flights that morning. The fourth and final flight was by Wilbur. He went 852 feet, and that would be approximately from here up to the Oregon Pavilion. The duration of the flight was 59 seconds, and he got up to 31 miles an hour. Or now, if you go halfway back from this year, back to 1903, you get to 1962, when this plane flew three times the speed of sound. After their fourth flight that morning, they took a, a break for breakfast. And unfortunately, a gust of wind came up and broke off one of the motor mounts. And his, their engine never ran since. On Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong and Cut Buzz Aldridge. Aldridge, thank you, took a fragment of the right flyer, piece of wood and fabric, to the moon on Apollo 11 in honor of the Wright brothers. I will run this just for a very short time because in the past we've had problems running it too long and we burn the exhaust valve. These exhaust valves needed to be made out of aged cast iron. My predecessors in the machine shop found some at a junkyard here in San Diego. The valves in this engine were made from a Coronado manhole cover. It was uh, this last summer, well, previous to that, uh, the last book on the Wright Brothers was released, and Tom Hanks bought the movie rights to it. And last summer, they were getting ready to go into production, and they needed to find out how the Wright brothers started their engine. So they called the museum back at Kitty Hawk and asked, can you give us the steps on how to, the Wright brothers would use to start the Wright Flyer engine? That museum told them, we don't know. Call the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. They told what they needed from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Smithsonian, can't say it, Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. said, we don't know. But the San Diego Air and Space Museum 
has an engine, and we know they run it periodically. So I ended up getting called by them, and a week later I gave them what I thought the Wright brothers would do to get the engine started when it was mounted on an airframe. So the interesting, because Tom Hanks and HBO were getting together to make a mini-series out of it, so when that comes up it'll be interesting to see what they did. I said I'm going to run it for just a short, very short period, but you will know what it sounded like in 1903 back in Kitty Hawk. You ready? Yes, sir. just amazing to see the progress uh, between uh, just a few hundred years ago and, and today. Now, uh, Jim Kidrick, slug, I call him his call sign, mine's Viking. Uh, he and his team have really got a great museum. And I want to say that my friend slug, the one, he's a very kind of uh, bashful, you know, he doesn't like to brag, but I can tell you, he is the world's second greatest fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the first? <laughs> anyway, anyway, if you have any questions, as long as my voice holds out, uh, and I'd be glad to try to answer them. By the way, 53 years ago, coming uh, the 21st of December, we went to the moon and back. Anybody? Did you yeah. just circle the moon, or did you? you yeah, we were the first to go around the moon. Okay. We didn't, that was the first trip. Yeah, they didn't give us enough fuel or a lunar module uh, to gotcha. land on it. But uh, anyway, it was the uh, first time we got to see the Earth, and I was fortunate enough to take uh, the Earthrise picture. Did you ever have any doubts you'd come back? I thought we had a one in three chance, really? actually, of um, having a one in three chance to having a successful mission. One in three chances of having to abort but get back alive. And I thought one in three chance of not making it back. But remember, this is the height of the Cold War. Duck and cover, all that stuff. And so we thought that was pretty pretty good odds in order to beat the Soviets. Yep. Both married to the same wives. 
That's been tough. <laughs> well, they're great girls. But uh, he was given a free reign uh, from uh, NASA uh, to say whatever was appropriate. He asked him, what should he say? He just said, say something appropriate, because they trusted him. And he asked a, a buddy of his in, I think, the U.S. Information Agency, and they racked their brains. You know, and his wife, uh, she was Jewish. She said, well, why don't you just go back and read from the book of Genesis, which is what he did. He didn't tell me until he handed it, he said, here, read this. <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, so I read the first, uh, you know, in the beginning. Uh, Frank later claimed that the biggest accomplishment of, uh, of Apollo 8 was getting uh, Bill Anders, a good Catholic, to read from a, uh, you know, <laughs> the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> Well, and Bill was also uh, the photographer of Earthrise, uh, the most famous picture from space, even today. And I just learned about a week ago that one of the original prints of Earthrise, I'm not sure what that meant, was auctioned off at $48,000. I just wish I had some, some kind of rights to that. <laughs> <laughs> that made a nickel. <laughs> Anyway, this is a great museum. It's probably the world's second greatest museum because we have a, a small one up in uh, up north. But no, this is so much uh, better. And uh, Slug and his uh, and his team have really done a great job. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go away. Didn't talk to you. The last century and the one prior really. Uh, centuries of mechanical engineering. I mean, with locomotives and steamboats. And airplanes like that. Yeah. And airplanes like that. Now, these, that airplane like that uh, is amazing. Even the, the one they're having trouble with in Boeing. You know, the, the, uh, the chips, the artificial intelligence. We, we went to the moon on Apollo 8 with a computer that was less than this watch. You know, it was analog. Uh, oh, you had onboard computers. Well, yeah. I mean... Well, not in his case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's just amazing to see the progress uh, between uh, just a few hundred years ago and, and today. Now, uh, Jim Kedrick, Slug, I call him his call sign, mine's Viking. Uh, he and his team have really got a great museum. And I want to say that my friend Slug, the one, he's a very kind of uh, uh, bashful, you know, he doesn't like to brag, but I can tell you that he is the world's second greatest fighter pilot. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the first? <laughs> anyway, anyway, if you have any questions, as long as my voice holds out, uh, and I'd be glad to try to answer them. Not only alive, but we're both married to the same wives. <laughs> That's been tough. <laughs> well, they're great girls. But uh, he was given a free reign uh, from uh, NASA uh, to say whatever was appropriate. He asked him, what should he say? He just said, say something appropriate, because they trusted him. And he asked a, a buddy of his in, I think, the U.S. Information Agency, and they racked their brains, you know, and his wife, uh, she was Jewish. She says, well, why don't you just go back and read from the book of Genesis, which is what he did. He didn't tell me until he handed it, he says, here, read this. <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, so I read the first, uh, you know, in the beginning. Uh, and Frank later claimed that the biggest accomplishment of, uh, of Apollo 8 was getting uh, Bill Anders, a good Catholic, to read from a, uh, you know, the King James Version of the Bible. <laughs> well, and Bill was also uh, the photographer of Earthrise, uh, the most famous picture from space, even today. And I just learned about a week ago that one of the original prints of Earthrise, I'm not sure what that meant, was auctioned off at $48,000. I just wish I had some, some kind of rights to that. <laughs> I'll back up. 
This is the 118th anniversary of the Wright Flyers' historic flights back at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. That took place in 1903. The Wright brothers realized to be able to fly, powered flight, they needed to come up with an engine. They decided or they calculated they had to have an engine that couldn't weigh more than 180 pounds and had eight horsepower. Their engine came in at 200 pounds, but it had 12 horsepower. The museum back in 1993, 10 years prior to the centennial, decided they wanted to have a prototype of the Wright Flyer engine. Three of my predecessors in the machine shop in two and a half years made two engines and this one has run on the anniversary every year since. The Bright, Bright Brothers had a fantastic mechanic machinist that worked for their bicycle shops, Charlie Taylor. This is a bust of him behind me. The engine just had to prove you could have powered flight. It wasn't for endurance or speed. And it's very simple. It doesn't have any spark plugs, doesn't have a carburetor, doesn't have an oil pump, doesn't have a fuel pump, and doesn't have a throttle, but it runs. Find out how the Wright brothers started their engine. So they called the museum back at Kitty Hawk and asked, can you give us the steps on how the Wright brothers would use to start the Wright Flyer engine? That museum told them, we don't know called the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. They told what they needed from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. The Smithsonian, I can't say it, Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. said, we don't know, but the San Diego Air and Space Museum has an engine and we know they run it periodically. So I ended up getting called by them and a week later I gave them what I thought the Wright brothers would do to get the engine started when it was mounted on an airframe.